Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brooke Miller. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Architecture. And I'm really excited that Emily hooked me up with the IP properly and also to, to welcome our guests. And this represents, it's a School of Architecture lecture series, but it was also included as part of the Department of Art and Art History, which completely makes sense given the work that our uh, guests from Cairo uh, do. And so I'm honored to introduce you to some dear colleagues and friends doing amazing collaborative work at the intersection of design, arts, heritage, and community development grounded in commitments to social justice and premised on a model of urban revitalization and change as emerging out of the tremendous richness of places and people that are sometimes viewed as unimportant if not, if they're even given consideration in the first place. So we're gonna have three presentations, uh, short presentations in a row. So. My Alabrashi is the founder of Magara Built Environment Collective, which is an NGO and architectural firm running out of Cairo. May also uh, founded the Atharlina Participatory Conservation Initiative. She's a lecturer at American University in Cairo in architecture. And in the fall, she won a Prince Claus Prize for Community Impact, which is a, it's a kind of a, a world globally recognized award. It's really a remarkable accomplishment, but it's really the work obviously that led up to it, that accomplishment that we're here to uh, talk about this afternoon. Um, Ahmed Zaza is the co-founder of Tentuba, which is urban policy research, participatory planning and urban designer. He's also co-founder of MAD, M-A-D-D, platform activist architecture and urbanism organization and an assistant professor of practice at Nile University. And then to, to complete the short presentations, Ahmed Mansour, who's the founder of Mansour for Architecture and Conservation. And he's assistant professor of practice, history of architecture and history of architecture at Nile University. And I should mention that we have other guests with us this week. And so Agnes Mikalchik is a digital animation, visual artist. How'd I do with your last name, Agnes? Okay. Professor of Applied Sciences and Arts at German University Cairo. And uh, it was Agnes and Shireen El Ansari, who's a storyteller, independent performance artist, and a PhD candidate at Goldsmith University of London, Department of Theater and Performance. They actually gave a digital animation storyteller kind of presentation on Tuesday, which was really remarkable and it led to a phenomenal conversation. Afterwards, um, Selma Bilal is where she works with me at Magara. She's a uh, teaching assistant at German University of Cairo. And then we also have two other guests that have been, we've been here all week and I'll explain why, um, who will be in the audience. Dr. Stacy Moran is associate director of the Center for Philosophical Technologies and an associate professor at English at Arizona State University. And Dr. Tessa Farmer, assistant professor of anthropology and global studies at the University of Virginia. And she arrived yesterday and her book had come out the week before and she brought some copies, everyday, well-connected everyday water practices in Cairo. So, and I'm sorry, this is so long, but I wanted to provide a little bit of a backdrop um, our colleague and friend Nabil Alhadi is a professor of architecture at Cairo University, invited me in 2015 to give a talk and participate in an urban design workshop. Um, and one day during that visit, he took me to the Al Khalifa neighborhood in medieval Islamic Cairo, which is part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And he in introduced me to Mai, who showed me some of the projects they were working on in the area. And that began a collaboration and friendship that uh, endures. And, um, and she also introduced me to this amazing team of uh, creative thinkers I, who we are blessed to have with us this week. And so in addition to the project-based work that they take on in a highly collaborative and cross-disciplinary way, they are establishing an educational platform in the arts and design and, and heritage and community development called Taihus. 
and the mission and goals of this educational platform really bear some strong similarities to the mission and goals of the College of Arts and Architecture. And so this week we've been working on developing a timeline and structure and content for this educational platform that they're developing. Um, but it's also helping us think about the development of our programs moving forward, including an MFA in community center practice, which is now being approved by the state. Um, Emily is developing in the MS architecture track, a critical heritage track. Um, and then Seiku Cooks lead, is, directs the urban design program. And he was with us as was Emily in October to talk about the intersection of these, these efforts. Um, we're also thinking about a master of visual culture studies and there's some strong alignment there to be sure within the Department of Art and Art History. So really rich opportunities for curricular and research collaborations in the years ahead. Before I ask you to extend a warm welcome to my Ahmed and Zaza, there are a couple of people I would like to thank. To begin with, Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Programs, uh, Jose Gomez, where are you, Jose? Who is really helped set it up and obtain some grants and do some other things to enable it to be possible to bring our hiring guests here and for us to be able to travel there. And then Emily Mockish, uh, Associate Director of the School of Architecture, who, as I said, is developing the Critical Heritage Track in collaboration with our colleagues from Cairo, but is also did so much legwork to make this happen. And lastly, I have to give some a shout out to Haley Wallace, who um, it works in business office here in the college who dealt with like five different itineraries <laughs> and did an incredible work to make it possible for our guests to be with us here. So without further ado, please welcome, we'll start with Mai and then we'll go with Zaza and then we will go with Ahmed Mansour. So first of all, I'd like to thank Brooke and company for the uh, invitation. It's been uh, an amazing three days, and um, I hope that the discussion that we can have today will uh, kind of be the icing of, on the cake, if you will. So, um, as Brooke said, my name is Maya Lebrashi. I run a, uh, an initiative called Atarlina in historic Cairo. Um, Atarlina translates as heritage is ours, so it's an initiative that, is, that concerns itself with the idea, the question of ownership of heritage. And how is it that if that people, if they have a sense of ownership of the heritage, they become active custodians of their heritage and active participants in the process of, process of preservation of their heritage. Um, the initiative is run by uh, Megawara, which is an architectural office, and the, the Built Environment Collective, which is an NGO. So we started in 2011 as a co-working space, as a cultural space for people who are interested in the built environment in general. And even then, our idea was, uh, so in Egypt, architecture is more closely related to engineering than um, the arts and humanities and social sciences. And our idea was to kind of see if we could move it more uh, to explore the links between the arts and the humanities and social sciences through uh, creating this cultural space um, and creating a community around an, a different kind of understanding of, of, of architecture. In 2012, we decided that we should start working a little bit on the ground. My background is as a conservation architect. So one of the, the projects that we started to work on was a project to investigate the relationship of communities with their heritage and to investigate this idea of a sense of ownership that I was talking about. And, and our thesis was that this sense of ownership had been disrupted somehow. And our question was, how do we, how do we, how do people regain the sense of ownership of their heritage? Uh, Ahmad Mansour will probably go into this uh, in more detail, but what you need to know is that Historic Cairo is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and we work in the southern uh, section of Historic Cairo, very close to Cairo Citadel, which also Ahmad Mansour will show uh, in a bit more detail. So these are the three areas that we work in. Uh, two residential neighborhoods, and the historic cemetery in, in Cairo. And what you need to know about the historic cemetery in Cairo is that it is partially built up and partially lived in historically so. So it's a very kind of special, it's a very special kind of place. 
So our interest is always in kind of the, the, the 12th century monument that you see in the background of this picture, but also what you see in the forefront, the community that lives around these monuments. In uh, 2012, we started a, a process of six months of stakeholder participatory research workshops. And you see Zaza here, who's also going to talk immediately after me, the one with the bun. And the idea um, of these workshops was to work with different kinds of stakeholders to think collectively about this idea of uh, ownership and uh, of Hanu heritage and uh, Hanu heritage as a resource. Um, we chose a neighborhood that was rich in heritage, but that was also a vibrant uh, residential neighborhood with quite um, a strong interest in heritage because most of the buildings were shrines. So this was the Khalifa Street area. And uh, after six months of talking, uh, um, through in, in, during which we started to work on very um, preliminary ideas for how further work could happen, we decided that one, we should not leave because originally we weren't really thinking that we would stay. It was kind of an intellectual exercise, if you will. But one of the things we felt were very crucial to us was not to uh, lose the, the, the trust that we had built with the community and also to make sure that we were not extractive as researchers, that we didn't just go to a place, find out what we wanted to find out, maybe write a paper or write an article and then leave. We felt that the knowledge gained should be put to good use. And for us, it was first that conservation of the, uh, the monuments should happen, but it should be linked to adaptive use for the benefit of the community. Two, uh, this link to heritage is established at a young age. So heritage education is extremely important. It later morphed also into vo vocational education, which basically means thinking about ways in which people can gain, uh, um, can make uh, money and gain a livelihood out of heritage inspired and heritage based uh, work such as tourism, such as crafts, for example. And three, thinking about it in an urban context. How do we build on the existing socioeconomic patterns? How do we improve them uh, in order to make the quality of space better for the listed, uh, for the heritage sites and for the community alike. So thinking about infrastructure services, um, uh, quality of open spaces and environmental issues. So this is a short two minute film. Um, the sound is um, disabled according, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so it seems a bit, it seems a bit strange without the sound. I can hear it. Why can I hear it? I guess I can hear it from the from the from the, from the screen. Um, yeah, I'm just not going to say anything. Just you know, two minutes. Enjoy the two minutes without having to hear me speak.
So um, in the last 10 years, we have worked on the cons conservation of uh, five uh, heritage buildings um, and listed heritage buildings and also two historic buildings that are not listed, but that we have also renovated and retrofitted for use for the activities that we run for the community. We've also um, uh, worked on three conservation studies for other monuments and very recently we finished work on a visitor center uh, in one of the buildings that we have conserved. And this, these are some of the, the projects that we've worked on. We also, in terms of working with children, we run heritage summer camps. These are two month summer camps uh, that started off with around 20, 30 children. Now we're up to 80. We can go up more if we have the capacity, which unfortunately we don't. And as I mentioned earlier, the older kids are now enrolled in a more focused vocational training program that shows, uh, shows them how uh, the career paths that are available within heritage. Um, we also run, um, um, uh, tours, we run an annual uh, uh, heritage promotion festival called Spend the Day in Khalifa. Uh, all of this, both to uh, promote the neighborhood as a place that can be visited, to create activities that can um, uh, generate income for the community, um, and also for us, so that we're partially, we're not really sustainable, we're donor based, but so that we could potentially in the future uh, be partially sustainable. And as I said, also show the younger generation that heritage is, is multifaceted and can be useful as a, a job, uh, as a career path. Um, so, so these are some of the interactive activities run with children, our vocational training activities and the products that come out of them. Um, on an urban level, we, um, we study the neighborhoods where we work pre preparing conservation and management plans and Ahmad Mansour, who was, a, was our consultant on this project, will explain uh, this more in his uh, presentation. The, the project that, uh, that we work with, uh, that Brooke works with us uh, on, um, is a project looking at the issue of groundwater in historic Cairo. And this is not natural groundwater. This is water that has leaked from supply and sewage pipes. And uh, it's an endemic problem, so it's not that easy to fix. So normally where heritage buildings are concerned, they install like local dewatering systems around the buildings uh, to prevent them from being inundated with water because they're lower than the street level. So what we've been uh, um, experimenting with is actually taking some of this water and reusing it potentially for cleaning and fire control, but mostly for greening. And so this is the, um, um, our biggest project so far in Khalifa Park. And these spaces that we create are also spaces to bring the community together uh, in order to build partnerships with them so that they become part of our decision-making process. Um, this is another neighborhood where we work, and this is an Al Hattaba neighborhood that was threatened with demolition. And in this case, we worked with different stakeholders, including the government, to open up new ways of thinking about that neighborhood uh, where heritage can be used as a resource to uh, improve it and also to prevent the demolition, uh, to kind of get the government to see that what they're demolishing is, is potentially a resource in the future, if not in the present. And we managed to get uh, the government to stop the demolition, but unfortunately there has been no rege regeneration work, no re regeneration work has happened. So the, the neighborhood is still not in a very good condition. Um, the work that we do is shared in multiple ways uh, through uh, websites. Uh, we have three websites uh, that through which we share our work, and one of them also has access to our online um, occasional periodical Megara papers, which so far I think we've done five um, uh, volumes, um, five uh, issues. Um, that report on uh, different, uh, the different work that we do, but that also contain toolkits. So for example, a toolkit uh, on, on how to deal with groundwater in an integrated manner, another one about the, the laws of historic Cairo, etc. This is my last slide. And um, I thought that I would just use it to show you some of the issues that we grapple with because ours is not a very kind of big um, institution, but because we work in an integrated manner, um, we, we the, the, the problems that we deal with are, are quite complex and we have to approach them in, in we have to be very organic and agile in the way we approach them. So, uh, so this complexity of the story, how do we tell it and how do we use the telling to understand what we're doing? Because when you're doing so many different things and you're being very organic in the way you're approaching them, sometimes you lose sight of what you originally planned to do. 
Um, we also work in a context that is constantly shifting and changing. You can't really plan in, in Egypt as such. So, uh, I mean, you would never have that question that says, oh, how do you see yourself in 10 years or two years or even a year sometimes? So how do you, how, how do you deal with that constantly shifting environment? We also work with multiple, multiple partners who have conflicting claims to heritage. Uh, so the claim that a resident will have to, her to heritage will be very different from that of the state, for example. And we work with all of them. And we have to be careful about co-optation with uh, yeah, being co-opted by the government, but we also do not want to cut the link to any of these different stakeholders. Uh, so partnering ethically is an important issue um, and being mindful of how we partner is also an, an important issue. Partnering in general requires a lot of energy. So where do we find that energy? Um, and then this directly relates to the HIOS, which is the, um, the educational platform that uh, we, we've been here for three days discussing. What kind of team do you need to work to do this kind of work? It's definitely not just architects. Definitely. And as much as we architects like to think that we, you know, we're, we're design thinkers, we can do this and we can do, do that, we cannot. It's important for us to learn how to ask the right questions, but know that we do not have the answers and that the answers come collectively by working in an interdisciplinary manner. Um, and then what do we do with what we learn? It's, it's very interesting. We, we work really fast. A lot is always going on. We're learning a lot of things and we're also forgetting them. So there is a responsibility to kind of document these methodologies and discuss them with others and to share them so that they might benefit from them, critique them, build on them, etc. And that again requires time and energy that an, an overstretched organization such, such as ours might not have. And finally, um, I think that it, we kind of get bogged down in the details because it's almost like it seems like a constant tr struggle to survive. But at the same time, we need to maintain this awareness that we are part, we are an integral part of what's happening on a global level in terms of how to deal with complicated, dense cities. And we also um, um, need to understand and, and keep an, an eye on the fact that, um, and I've lost my train of thought right now, let me see what do I have here that can make me um, yes um, and and we also need to think so so we kind of ground ourselves in the neighborhood where we, neighborhoods where we work but we always have to kind of reconcile this vertical impact that we're trying to uh, to to have by working in one neighborhood but at the same time thinking horizontally about the potential impact that we might have by sharing knowledge but also maybe working with others who, 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 who work in other neighborhoods in, in different ways, et cetera. And that also takes quite a lot of planning and quite a lot of thought. And I think that this would be it for me. These are our pages. And I always like to thank our sponsors and donors and partners, including UNC Charlotte. And that's it for me. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Um... My name is Ahmed Zaza, and thank you, Brooke, for uh, the introduction. Of course, thank you for having us here. And um, so I'm, I'm going to speak about um, uh, the company that I'm part of, I'm a co-founder of, which is, uh, its name is Tentuba. And uh, this company was established in 2014, and the driver for establishing this company was um, seeing all the uh, spatial inequalities that you cannot miss by by just living in in, in, in Egyptian cities and villages and um, seeing all these like uh, deliberate, deliberate neglectance from the government towards a lot of challenges that face low income communities, marginalized and deprived uh, communities in, uh, in the Egyptian uh, cities and villages. So this of course, it created a lot of gaps and um, uh, concerning social justice uh, and of course, a lot of different inequalities that we wanted to fill a little bit of this gap through understanding what's happening, advocating for it. And on, in some cases, maybe we can do some interventions by working closely with local communities uh, for uh, upgrading uh, their, their own neighborhoods and so on. So yeah, so um, um, it's an interdisciplinary group. Uh, uh, we, are, we, are, um, we are always working, uh, trying to work with uh, 
uh, different disciplines, but of course not like a wide variety of disciplines, and that's why maybe we're here. And but we our work always involves um, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, uh, and some sometimes artists. So um, mainly we do have two arms in this company, which is the first arm, which is the research that it's involved investigations and uh, doing studies in, in uh, like uh, in policy analysis and social assessments, doing a lot of mappings. And the other arm, which is the participatory planning or the on-ground work where we are working closely with local communities, which is not happening that flexible lately because it's not that easy now to work in, in the field. But we had some projects in some ways also to overcome uh, the problems of uh, working in the field in, uh, in the Egyptian cities and villages. We had, we're always having like a lot of publications and these and all of our publications, we're always keeping them as open sources and we are having different platforms in Tantuba where we disseminate and publish uh, all of our work and different publications. So I will, I will go through some of our work, maybe it will give you an overview of exactly what we do because our work is we, we work mostly on like horizontally, geographically, and uh, we have different scopes uh, of, uh, of, uh, of work, different scopes of research that we work on, um, uh, uh, intersects with the challenges or the issues of the built environment, like uh, um, uh, climate change, uh, gender issues, um, urban politics, urban economy, and so on. So one of our main platform, which is the urban observatory, um, the built environment observatory, and this is um, like a sub website from our main website, which where we are publishing all our research that, that we're doing. So there are different, uh, uh, like you can you can see here the tabs and uh, these, the, uh, sorry, the tags and these tags are showing the different issues that we are trying to cover in our research. And sometimes we are doing like series or, or projects, like lately we've, uh, we've published this investigation about who owns Cairo, where we were trying to uh, understand all the uh, real estate developers and what do they own in the city and how they are controlling the expansion in this, uh, of, the, of the city and a huge part of the urban economy that Egypt actually is leaning on as main drive or main source of, uh, of, of uh, financing. Um, and, and also we had, we had previous series uh, like the intersections with um, uh, gender and housing and we had uh, a series of four episodes um, or four different articles, big research um, uh, about uh, women and housing. Um, another another platform that also we uh, we are trying uh, these days to update um, it's um, the built environment deprivation indicator, and which is an interactive map where we um, uh, try to uh, cat categorize uh, what is uh, deprivation, what is urban deprivation, and this these categorizations we went through six different categorization like aff affordability crowding. Uh, secure tenure, safe water, sanitation, and so on. And th through this map, we are going through the different governorates uh, in Cairo. And it's, as I was saying, it's interactive. So you can go over the different cities and see uh, the levels of deprivation concerning each category of these. So, and, and again, these are mostly uh, projects to, um, uh, the, these are research projects that, main intention of these projects are is advocating for these problems and of course keep raising awareness and providing open source information because um, this uh, platform for example you can download all the raw data uh, that we built on these um, uh, maps which are all official data actually and official census we also work on uh, creating um, uh, manuals and this was one of the manuals that we worked on um, uh, it was a partnership with the GIZ, and uh, it's, it was um, a manual to be used by non-professionals uh, to how to apply uh, participatory needs assessment when working with local communities. So this manual can be used by um, professionals and can be used by the government, can be used by NGOs, and of course can be used by the local communities themselves, which were my, uh, our main important, uh, our most important uh, stakeholder in this. So um, it's a it's user-friendly manual uh, con containing a lot of tools. So it's like a toolbox that has different tools 
and um, different ways in using these tools, uh, uh, of course, in relation to what exactly do you want to research uh, with the community. So again, it's an, it's an open source tools that we are, um, we are lately even have been uh, working on updating them as, uh, up updating them as well. Um, one of my personal favorite projects is Lina Fil Medina. Lina Fil Medina is again is an awareness uh, project that uh, we are uh, we are uh, it's an ongoing project which is animated series. Probably I, uh, maybe um, Heather's students have uh, have been uh, like open for this uh, for this project. But um, so yeah, we've it's it's an animated series. We are trying to uh, simplify a lot of our research because the research that we are producing and the research that other people are producing, it's, it's mostly circulated between the uh, circle of uh, professionals. So we were trying to uh, expand or widen the circle of uh, uh, beneficiaries for uh, these researchers. So we try to simplify the outcomes and to put it in different modes like uh, animated series and other modes that I will, I will explain later. Um, another platform that, um, that um, we uh, helped in creating and we are still working on it, which is a wiki platform. So it's like Wikipedia, but for urbanism. So we developed this um, uh, project with the uh, Arab Studies Institute and it's, um, it's an ongoing project. It's still, we're, we're still working on it. It's our second year and we, we, are, we are extending the third year um, in 2023. And it's, um, as I was saying, it's an open source where we are having different types of, um, of resources that can benefit uh, students and researchers, decision makers maybe. So we're having researchers, we're having uh, uh, maps and sensors, uh, urban dictionaries and glossaries for definitions and so on. We're having, um, uh, uh, trying to document lectures and conferences and workshops, and we are having different libraries for maps, videos, uh, books, and so on. So yeah, so the, the previous part, it was most about research and about advo uh, uh, advocacy and about raising awareness. And now these are projects where we are, we're trying to do some interventions. So um, uh, partnering with the Habitat for Humanity, we've been working on uh, the affordable housing strategy to, um, um, to update the housing strategy for her, uh, Habitat for Humanity, as well as even using these strategies to try to uh, investigate how they, uh, how they can be applied in reality. So we've worked with um, um, very closely with the local communities in Upper Egypt, in the villages in Upper Egypt. And, and these villages, it was very hard to reach um, because like, you can't find them on the map. They are, they are really very small and uh, they are very um, marginalized. So um, it was very important to reach there and to try to understand exactly uh, what are the urban issues they are uh, facing? And of course, we've seen um, numerous houses that are lacking, starting from sanitation, which is uh, a simple problem, up till uh, houses without roofs. And we've, we've been working closely with them to find solutions, how, to, how can they um, start uh, finding ways for micro, micro loans or how they can organize themselves and work together in, 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 in building their, their own houses and so on. Um, another partnership we worked with, uh, it was with the Arab Academy for Science and Technology, where I was graduated and had my diploma from, and now I'm teaching there since 2007. Um, and it was very important also for us to how to partner with the, with the students, um, which, which, which really benefited us very much in working with the Hayus project, that's why we're here today. So um, it's, um, it's how, to, how to make the students leave their studios and to understand that the designs that they're putting in the studios that they actually can be realized in in in, in the real life so uh, it was um, a workshop and and an internship that we extended the course that i was teaching there uh, co-teaching co there and um uh, we've been uh, working on um, issues concerning um, public spaces in one of the neighborhoods in cairo called Heliopolis. And we're, it's, it's, again, it's ongoing that we are trying to reach negotiations with the government to see how can uh, the outcomes of the projects can be applicable. Um, yeah. 
So another project where, where, where we, we had partnership with GIZ as well. It was um, uh, working uh, in uh, upgrading two different neighborhoods in, in Cairo and Giza. And the partnership was also with Cairo Governorate and Giza Governorate. Um, we were working on um, uh, what was called local area development plan where we are, we're trying to apply a participatory uh, process to upgrade um, uh, different issues in, the, in, in both neighbor, neighborhoods concerning public spaces, transportation, uh, markets, and so on. So yeah, I'm trying to just to go very quickly so that I don't take much time. Um, uh, one of our first projects also were, was um, the uh, uh, investigating the um or working very closely with the uh, with the community in uh, ramlet bole maybe seiko's uh students here were relate um uh, it was again it was one of these uh, neighborhoods that uh, were under the threat of demolitions and actually it was demolished uh recently and um uh, the team in tantuba they were, we were working on uh how to how to understand exactly what are the losses that they will lose by when their houses are being demolished or they're being relocated and reflecting this towards all the relocations that has been lately happening all over Cairo and, and, and different other cities. So yeah, so mainly now um, the focus of Tentuba, we are trying to create a platform where we are uh, expanding this idea that I, I, I was ex explaining earlier, like clean up in Medina, to how to make our research um, reach more and more people through diff different uh, uh, mediums. So, so uh, we're 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 now working on um, been always working uh, and turning our research into interactive maps and infographics. But also, we want to expand uh, our uh, uh, experience in anim uh, videos and anim animated series, podcasts, and graphic novels, which we are um, in, in the coming months. We are starting our first experience by how to turn uh, one of our um, uh, big researchers concerning the intersection between uh, urbanism and environment to turn it into a graphic novel so that it can reach even more, more and more people as well. Um, uh, one of our latest project is the Hayus, and probably I, I won't go uh, a lot for, uh, for it as much as um, uh, the Hayus is, uh, we were trying, it's, it's an attempt to try to uh, think about an, an educational uh, program slash platform where we can um, uh, apply more interdisciplinary uh, 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 approaches in teaching architecture and urban uh, design slash pla uh, planning. And one of our uh, um, uh, uh, activities, it was an internship that we had last uh, July where um, we've worked with the, with, the, with the students. They were uh, like senior students and fresh grads um, from different uh, universities. So we had architecture and we had media. Um, uh, we had uh, students from uh, law, um, uh, economics and, and, and political sciences. So we've been working on, tr we, we, we tried to, to develop a tool in reading um, uh, historical um, uh, timelines concerning informal areas and self-built housing to how can we uh, just categorize uh, all the issues concerning um, uh, this typology and to how to read it uh, all together. And we are also still developing it, but there were already a lot of outcome and a lot of uh, maps that we already have been working on in Tentuba and they, they were able to update these maps as well. And the last thing it was, Again, lately, just like the last month, um, like maybe three weeks ago, we've, we've also finalized the second internship. It was a um, um, uh, partnership with the University of Halwan. It's a local university um, for uh, applied arts. And we've been trying to push uh, more for Lina Fil Medina project, which is the animated series, by also letting the students from applied uh, arts, which is totally far away from, uh, uh, urbanism and architecture to just to also to to give their say and to how to read the city and how to read the problems in the city and reflect it through their skills of um, illustrations and animations and uh, so on so yeah so what happened okay anyway this was the last slide anyway so yeah thank you so much
<laughs> okay, so hello, um, I'm Ahmad Mansour, I'm an architect. Um, I've been working um, in Cairo for a number of years now. Uh, basically, what um, I'm interested in or what I've been working on for the past 20 years is urban conservation. And um, in Cairo, it's not always evident, this idea of urban conservation. When we talk to people in Cairo, they are always interested in single building conservation or development of new areas. But when we talk about urban conservation, it becomes too heavy, especially um, with the current um, also um, um, projects that is going on now in Cairo. Um, this picture I'd like to always to start with for a very simple reason. This is the citadel of Cairo. The citadel uh, overlooks Cairo. It is from the 10th century. Um, and the area that is available for people to visit is one third of the surface area of the citadel. The rest of this area is dilapidated, underutilized, and nobody knows about it anything. For 12 years now, I've been involved in projects concerning the area that is not available for visitation. And I've been involved with different institutions. So I worked for UNESCO for a couple of years, for five years, to create a conservation plan and a management plan for the World Heritage um, property, Historic Cairo. And the action area was the citadel and the neighborhood or the area surrounding this, area, this monument. Later, an investor was interested and he wanted to invest in the adaptive reuse of this um, area again. Lastly, just a couple of months ago, a consortium, a kind of uh, PPP, uh, a private um, public partnership between investor, operator, and the government signed an agreement to adaptively reuse this area. So this is the old project. Uh, I will just, this is the urban regeneration project of Historic Cairo. It was uh, a project led by UNESCO to create, as I said before, the conservation plan and management plan for the World Heritage property. For you to know, um, Historic Cairo was listed in 1979 uh, for um, it's absolutely unquestionable historical, archaeological, and urban importance. So, fine, 1979, it's listed. We don't have any bylaws or any protection measures for the World Heritage property. 2010, we started a project to, first of all, create the boundaries of historic Cairo and to create the Conservation plan and management plan. Conservation plan basically is, there's part that is a survey on the ground. So we survey what is there as, as um, a physical um, uh, city, but also we have a desktop research on the history, on socioeconomic, on the de demographics of the city. It's a huge work. And at the end, we come up with a conservation plan and interventions on um, the built environment. This is interesting because this will lead that I will work with Magaura for creating the conservation plan of an area, which is Al Khalifa. They have been involved in this area for the past 12 years. So with the same idea, and the same methodology that we used in UNESCO for a conservation plan, we will do the same for El Khalifa area. We will survey 
almost 1,600 1, buildings. We will survey the streets, the open spaces, all the activities, what's going on in this part of the city in order to create a conservation plan to understand what we have. We have classes of buildings, intervention on, on each building, what we can do in each building, the users, the needs assessment. So what is missing in, in terms of services, in terms of um, activities in the area. And we have a very clear vision, what we want to do with the area. And this is the part that is ahead for Megaura because they worked in this area. They had a link with the people. They knew the needs. Huh? They paved uh, a way to actually find um, what we can do with all these dilapidated and empty plots in the neighborhood of El Khalifa. And accordingly, we have a vision and a development project for the area. This picture here is the main market of the Khalifa area. We decided to take this marketplace as a pilot project and see if our conservation plan, what we had in mind, can work really or not. Is it? We have to test it on the ground. So, from the needs assessment, we knew the vendors, what did they what they wanted in this area. From the uh, mobility study, we understood this mix between vehicle and pedestrian. We're starting to actually implement. Huh? It, it took us more than nine months now, back and forth huh, with the design until we have something that hopefully in the coming few months we will be able to execute. And from El Khalifa and from the conservation plan, I talked the methodology um, that we use in UNESCO and then applied again in El Khalifa. I was asked again to apply it in another area, which is also surrounded, is a surrounding area of the citadel, Darbilla Beno. This has a very different um, idea. This area. Um, almost, um, you have almost 60% of the buildings uh, that is empty. There is an investor that started buying plots of lands and buildings there, and he's interested to create a kind of boutique hotel, a Marrakesh style kind of area. So catering to whomever is coming to visit historic Cairo. Definitely, we always have a problem. Uh, I don't want to sound like a, a, a romantic uh, vision of heritage, but we always have a problem because the impact of tourism on any historic city is usually to, um, I don't want to sound negative, but it's too harsh. Um, We've seen a lot of cities when tourism takes over the activities of the city itself, it becomes um, kind of, as, as we call it, uh, um, Disney, Disney-fied kind of. Um, so, so this is a problem and the mitigation uh, plan for such a thing, you can always yeah, welcome visitors to an area. But you have to find a mitigation force to stop the deterioration huh? and the quality of life of the people that live there. Um, currently, this project is being um, you know, is now. It's it's a very weird also project because it's subsidized by the government. So the government is very happy with the idea to have a boutique hotel beside the citadel. But at the same time, with the economic crisis that we have now, it's not moving up. So it's, it's this 
a very weird time that we don't understand exactly what would happen for this project. Um, again, I'll go back to the citadel, the area that is not um, utilized. This is the area uh, of Babel Azab, which is the lower enclosure of the citadel. It's around 70,000 um, square meter, so it's a huge area. You don't have any anything inside, as you can see. This used to be the um, the army barracks, so the British and the Egyptian uh, barracks at one, one time. Um, but during the 80s, it stopped uh, being used almost, except for some uh, very few uh, workshops uh, and um, yeah, very few areas that have been used in this, this part. And the idea was to create a creative hub. This area has a number of residential um, um, clusters around. And the idea is to create a link once more between the areas outside of this uh, citadel and this new creative hub that will be um, installed inside Bevelaza. What is the idea of the creative? The creative hub works on three main ideas, education, production, and marketing. So we're creating, we're educating crafts, music, um, arts. We are bringing in designers and craftsmen to work together to produce more contemporary uh, uh, elements. The motto is from, lo from local to global. So the idea is to produce things locally and to export them uh, um, so yeah, with the hires we had two were um, internships. Zaza mentioned them earlier. I think these two um, uh, internship. I decided to concentrate on the area where the the, the mosque with the demolished area around it um, that I mentioned earlier to be the focus of the two internships. As you can see here, I was trying to. Uh, understand with the internship itself and to create a narrative for this area the narrative whether it's a historical narrative or even the uh, the current situation the current narrative what we can do with that and how can we move forward with such a narrative of an area that has changed a lot in the past um, hundred years This is the second uh, internship, and I will finish with this slide. Um, this internship was meant to link the myth and the history of the area with what's happening today. And that was the whole idea with the students when they came, is we don't take history as is. How can we move in this history with our current uh, situation in different forms. So we can see here, some of them decided that they want to have this graphic novel. Others decided that it will be sound of, of the city itself from the militia to the ahwa, to the coffee shop, to the, the dogs and cats that are the stray dogs and cats. That is a, a very important part of the streets and landscape of Cairo. Um, and few of the of the of the students now will take this uh, uh, a kind of a further step, and that will be their uh, final project. Um, they are graduating this semester, and they will work more on it to produce either a small movie or a graphic novel concerning the area of Al Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Heritage and conservation of buildings. You know, I don't know much about city's history, but how do you deal with, you know, systemic issues? 
to and, and not reinforce that there's a difference between teaching care and like children for conservation of, of moments and of the built environment that are maybe not the historical moments that you want to celebrate or parts of the history that are not the, the best parts of the best. And you often tell the narratives of history and the troubles concerning and the wars and praying and amplifying and what do we do? Like narratives, is that your question? Yeah. Um, I think that this is uh, this is at the core of the work that we do um, in Akademia. Because right from the start, we were keen on emphasizing uh, the community's claim to the and um, I think the most, um, so our understanding of heritage is quite wide. Um, it includes intangible heritage, it includes what we can call the heritage in the lake, in the way. So, what is it that's happening today that is the heritage of the future? It also includes the community's understanding of its own heritage. So, myths of oral history and uh, the negative and positive press are very important. And they're not just important. Um, in an abstract manner, they're important because they guide our um, the strategies and the tactics uh, that we employ to work uh, on the ground. I'll give you uh, two examples. Uh, the first example is the neighborhood of that I was talking about. I didn't explain why the neighborhood was a preferred demolition. What happened was, what happened was that the neighborhood was within the buffer zone of the citadel, which is one of the most important listed monuments in Cairo. And being inside the buffer zone of a, of a listed monument means that um, the Ministry of Antiquities controls what happens within that buffer zone, which makes sense. It means that you're not supposed to build a high rise within the buffer zone. But the easy way out for that was just to say, you can't build, you can't renovate your homes, you can't repair them, which meant that for 50 years, people were not allowed to fix their homes. They became dependent to disrepair and they became dangerous. One well, comes again as a potential injury and lists the areas that people have affected because of sea level issues. So for us, this was not simply a question of life and history, which it was, it was also a question of the life they inherited and heritage of history. What history are you telling? Is it the history of the citadel with the sultans and the emirs and whatever? Or is it the, her the, the history of the everyday life of history? And one of the things we worked on was a, uh, a, a patchwork. It was made by the women, women of the community to tell their own history uh, of the spaces and the places that they think are uh, valuable. And we use this as an ethnography tool as well. And, and so, which brings us to me to my second point, which is the idea of bringing communities into the process of retelling this history in many different ways. So, for example, the tours that we run or the products that we, that we make, they're not just made by the community. They're also designed in collaboration with the community. So that it's, an, it's a different kind of story that is being told and where, where uh, that uh, the community is in charge of it and feels that it can uh, claim as its own. Um, it actually started with a, with uh, I'm a very loud right? Oh, I am. So um, it started with um, our work started just before uh, the revolution to realize that there is a need for uh, start to work with the local communities and to understand more what's happening actually. So um, by the time the revolution erupted, it was um, there were this what so what was called popular committees and which is community organizations that uh, in neighborhoods they started to organize themselves to um, take matters into hand for um, fixing their neighborhood uh, problems and sometimes to start even being more radical to go for a, or, uh, uh, calls for upgrading all their whole uh, neighborhoods and this is where we started to um, attend meetings 
where the local communities are uh, uh, doing their meetings to organize for from different neighborhoods. And this is how we started to um, uh, work uh, through a previous initiative, uh, previ uh, previous from uh, Tantuba. So we started to work um, uh, to know the local communities from these meetings. And when we worked in one area, uh, we were not our work was noticed by another area. So we started to work with them. But by year 2014, most of these uh, popular communities were totally um like there was not, uh, nearly i can it's fair to say that they were not working anymore for political reasons and um and because of course you can imagine community organization this is always a big threat for um for any kind of, uh, of a system so um uh, now now actually we're struggling to find ways to uh, reach the local communities however in our latest work we've been uh, trying to find um, uh, local NGOs as a key entry for networking with different communities and so on. But uh, I just yeah maybe um, for for the historic city usually it's very easy because uh, the coffee shop the Ahwa is a very important part of the daily life of the people. If you start going to the coffee shop. Uh, usually you get a very good uh, contact with people, especially men. Uh, with women, it's usually different a little bit to um, to get in contact with them. Uh, but I think this this uh, it depends also because you know Cairo, you have a lot of different approaches or different even lifestyle. So with Heliopolis, for example, which is uh, a middle upper class uh, area in, in Cairo, the approach was totally different. It was not through actually a coffee shop. It was through social media, for example. Our 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 contact came through the social media platforms. So so it depends. I think it's, it's not you don't have a very clear kind of uh, way of approaching the. It depends on the community itself and which area of Cairo you're working on. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's different because we are based in the neighborhood where we work, so it's kind of more immersive, and we chose uh, to do it that way. Uh, but the one thing I, I really like to emphasize, and I refer to it in my uh, talk, is the fact that um, a lot of us do not realize that the work that we do is extractive. We do not realize that we think that knowledge in general is good. That if we are doing something in a manner that is rigorous and that is ethical in, in the methodology itself, then this is, this is good. But if this knowledge is extracted uh, by taking people's time and people's hopes and people's dreams, and then it goes into your uh, dissertation and, or your paper, and nothing comes out of it for the community, this is a problem. And um, places like Historic Cairo, we have, I don't know how many masters and PhD students that we have, we have a lot of them. And it is kind of the go-to place. So every other day, there is someone going into the street and asking people questions. And after a while, this really breaks trust between researchers and people and professionals and the people in these communities. So I think it's very important to be cognizant, not just of kind of what you are producing, but also how you're producing it and the nature of the collaboration and making sure that the process itself, the time, the, as I said, the hopes, the dreams, that this is, um, um, that, 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 that you've given thought to that and, and that you've we've worked with this ethically and morally. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I have a question about climate vulnerability and adaptation. And I know that your work also you look very closely at resource awareness and management and improving green infrastructure strategies. You talk about those strategies. Um, for for Ten Tuba's work, it's. Um... It's, the, it's it's only started the last year when we started to focus on this intersection between urbanism and um, an environment and climate change 
and um, we've been trying to work as much as possible for um, um, tracing the intersections between the real estate, the expansion of the real estate market with the with and and all the the price on the environment and all the impacts for climate change. And now we're starting a new research where we are trying to trace cement as the main fuel for all the urban expansion and all the construction. Um, to uh, to also to uh, look at it uh, as again what what does it put on the environment the construction of it and also how to see it uh, with with other intersections like uh, politics because it's there is again it's uh, it's it's all inter inter wine so um um as I presented, we are trying. Um, we're we're having this um, uh, graphic novel that we will start working on on it uh, the next month, and um, we're um, we're also um, um, through um, a network called um, uh, Network of uh, of uh, Urban Studies in Egypt that it was recently formed. We are starting now the um, uh, uh, roundtable discussions to work on this prepare, in, in preparation for uh, a book. However, of course, this, um, um, this again, it's, it's, it's totally separ separated from the, um, uh, the, the, the community to, 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 to be aware about all the bigger uh, issues for, for urbanism. So uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe you have more on ground. Um, we've been thinking about um, the connection between heritage and conservation and climate change for a couple of years now. And I guess I could say that our thought process falls along three lines. So the first one is um, related to the effect of climate change on uh, heritage buildings. Um, it's actually forced us to change many of our methodologies and think about things in different ways. So um, I think the simplest example would be rain patterns. We are getting less rain, but also less frequently, which means that we get a lot of freak um, uh, uh, rainstorms, torrential rains, things of the sort, which means that the traditional ways of, um, of insulating buildings against rain do not work anymore. And this is a, a really a, a big dilemma for us because you want to maintain the old system, but it does not work. So how do you tweak it so that it is actually effective against the um, uh, kind of these new patterns? And this works for a, a number of different phenomena, like the, the temperature differential, for example, obviously sea level rise, this is the most obvious example as such. So that's like the first thing. The second uh, one is related to um, and this, we kind of have started thinking about, but we're not really working on. Uh, so the first one, we actually are now in the process of working on a toolkit for conservation and climate change. Uh, it's a technical toolkit to um, um, explain to people how to uh, work on historic buildings to protect them for climate change. The second one is, um, I'm sure that you've, you're, what, what did, how did the saying go? The best green building is the building that is not built, something, you're right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's one thing that we're very interested in pursuing further. There's kind of an indirect relationship um, uh, or f impact that we have, because if you work on conservation without thinking, you are preserving uh, certain know-how and certain materials that are much more environmentally friendly than what is normally used. So lime is like up there, but also stone because you can reuse it, uh, wood because it's re, what is it, replenishable? Yeah. Yes, that one, etc. cetera. Yeah. So, um, so, so this for us is an important issue and we're not thinking about how to address it in a, in a, in a more structured and more focused manner. The third one is um, what I refer to in the work that we do with Brooke, which is related to groundwater. Um, and um, this idea of, uh, of, of uh, harvesting and reusing uh, groundwater that um, uh, harms the buildings, but at the same time is a valuable resource that we can uh, reuse to save the water, but also to green um, uh, areas, um, uh, to, to introduce new green areas of the neighborhood. Um, and uh, and also obviously all the effects of the, of the green areas uh, to combat the urban heat island etc cetera, etc cetera. so these are the the, um, the things that we're thinking about I'll just scroll through uh, the suggestions the questions that are online and most of them are 
just a quote, but there was one about balancing tourism with the community and the preservation of the building. Okay, uh, so um, the, look, uh, the idea of heritage, it's basically, in my opinion, is related to the community and to the people living there. So if the people don't have any connection to that heritage, then you have a problem in managing this and in protecting this this, this heritage. Um, usually tourism, when it comes, it comes in with a lot of demands. So it's not um, um, an industry that is light. It's very heavy um, in terms of uh, logistics, in terms of uh, um, services. It's, it's, it's not an easy uh, 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 industry, um, especially like what we see in, in Egypt, where you have all these huge buses coming in with, you know, like 3,000 uh, visitors. Yeah, this happens mainly in the south, in ancient Egypt, but uh, in the ancient Egyptian, I mean, uh, temples and uh, monuments, so archaeological sites. But when we talk about a city, we've seen what happened in a number of cities that tourism took over. Uh, the the daily life and the quality of life of, of this city actually so um the balance i think is very important that if the the when we talk about the, the historical areas um if they are catering to the well-being of the people living there it will be inviting for visitors to come whether they are tourists local international level if it is a pleasant area for the people to live in, it will be a pleasant area for people to come and visit. So this balance should be reached at one point. Into in that respect, and, you know, and I don't know if there's one way to do 
deal with that necessarily, but um, you know that's the spirit that's present all the time, and so there too comes yeah. um, with from <laughs> um, so each of that. Um, I, I think at the end of, uh, of of the road, it's a power struggle between uh, the government that wants to bring in tourism, wants the money, uh, uh, investors that or tour, tour operator, investors, developers that want to gain money also, and the just totally marginalizing the community as if they don't exist. And I think this is the main issue. And in my opinion, um, in order to find the solution for this, usually it's empowering the community somehow. I mean, this takes a lot of energy and a lot of work to do, uh, but also the idea that it's a res responsibility also of the government itself um, to protect these communities. Uh, I, I don't think it's, it's one uh, one way uh, way of protecting it or or finding a solution for it. And most probably that will be also, we talk a lot about it. It's, it's part of actually the management plan of, of any city or of any neighborhood. The art and the, yeah, this is a way, uh, especially that we're not talking about art as art, but for me, for example, it's uh, it's 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 how you can really find a way for um, improving the income of these communities, especially in Egypt, where I mean maybe it's a little bit different than here, but uh, economically, it's empowering people on a political level or on an administrative level, and also on an economic level. I also think that um, there's homework to be done to excavate the dynamics of communities, because I think that we underestimate the resources, the local resources that communities have, and their ability um, to, um, uh, to take ownership of um, uh, the, 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 the whole process of bringing visitors to their neighborhood and also to take ownership of the process of generally improving the neighborhood economically. Um, so in our case, we know for a fact that there are members of the community that are able, uh, for example, to build. And when they build, they do not build for tourists, they build for, uh, they build homes for, uh, um, uh, just for people who need, who would like to continue living in, in this community. We know that there are people who are interested in investing in uh, small and micro scale businesses that cater to tourism because they want to benefit from tourism. But what we also know is that this is the least um, researched and the least studied aspect of, uh, of the economy of the city, probably because it's mostly informal. But, um, uh, and also because it's, it's not that easy to tell a bank uh, to kind of invest in 200 small businesses as opposed to getting one hotel chain and, and a chain and telling them, okay, take over this entire street. So, so I think that this is, is part of the responsibility of, of, uh, of people like us who are working on the ground because we're the ones who are able to go to that very small scale of detail. Um, um, but then there comes the, we, you, you can't do anything. You cannot work on the ground and advocate and lobby and be a pressure group and do whatever. So the other thing that needs to happen is a more structured and organized collaboration between different actors with different uh, uh, types of expertise so that this is something that really is formulated into a, work, uh, a working for, a formula. Because right now it's not. And this is one of the issues that we're facing. Yeah, thank you for this, because I think this is, um, this actually is very important, especially in the context of Cairo, because lately the wave, there is a huge wave of um, 
demolitions and it's it's mostly it's uh, directed for gent gentrifying the city the, the city core especially and the amount of demolitions that happened in in the city center of course in different historical neighborhoods were like, enormous for either directly investment uh, like uh, creating projects to invest in um, either uh, business districts or uh, 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 touristic projects or to uh, have uh, more roads and more bridges leading to other areas where there are touristic projects and business centers as well so the, the in front of this wave it's 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 a huge wave and it's very hard actually to uh, to deal with such a wave because the magnitude and the pace of it is we we've never witnessed probably or at least my my generation have never witnessed something as big as what's happening today in Cairo and also in different cities um before Tantuba I was part of um, Mad the platform where we were working in a historical area in the middle in the heart of Cairo and and it's today it's demolished we've been working for two years living in the area and uh, we we uh, we, tr we, tr we tried to work uh, to, to put the community with the government and in the end we've lost the whole battle about um, uh, trying to uh, uh, convince the government that this is a historical area and there is a historical value for it for this neighborhood and of course today it's uh, it will be all towers for hotels five stars hotels and so on and and I think there are of course there are projects that's being happening but as I was saying the 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 pace and magnitude it can you could so Magawara today they were were able to work closely with the community in Hattaba but how many how many people are there to work with how many areas that have been demolished already the capacity of the market who are of people who can work in this is totally uh, behind so so yeah of course this is what we are dealing with especially today in in in, in all of the demolitions that's happening and all the transformations that are uh, happening in Cairo leading um, to big amount of gentrification that's happening starting from downtown and other areas that surround it. Is it now? Yeah, the lecture series, um, Curating Urbanisms in a Drawdown, one of the purposes of the lecture series is to think about where we're at with architectural education and what some different models might be depending on you know what, what, what goals or values or ethics uh, are associated with the kind of work that we wanna do. And this is not the model, but it's certainly a very interesting one that I hope helps us think perhaps a little differently about how we go about doing things. Similarly, we have a new MFA in community-centered practices coming online, and how do we actually think of that as truly a catalyst for co-creation of work with communities that affect change in the kinds of neighborhoods that you mentioned, Nadia. So I'm just really struck by dense settings, a different kind of story, or as May said, how to tell the story so we understand what we are doing. And that's just an ongoing kind of critical reflective process. Um, and then homework to be done to excavate the resources in the community, which are the least understood economy of the city and the necessity of having to work with people in other disciplines to uncover that and to, to kind of make those opportunities latent and then support it. Um, and so, and also we are the ones able to understand that scale of detail. And so when I think about it, just these global forces and gentrification and massive scale projects, and what does it mean to do vertical and horizontal work? What does it mean to engage deeply in communities to the point that you decide to locate there? And it, it's a kind of a force of resistance in a way. And, you know, the things can be overwhelming, but in terms of these forces, but I just feel like um, the values inherent in the good work that you do and how you realize it and how it's a continually 
evaluated because as you said, we don't have the luxury of imagining, oh, if I could do anything I wanted in 10 years because we're here and this is what's happening. I just think this is a lesson for us all. And I think back to Esther Abano's talk, I believe in October, and we were asking her about, she's doing work in Sub-Saharan Africa. How would we approach engaging that kind of work? And her first thing was stop pretending you have all the answers. And I think that's a really healthy thing, which is a very different message than what architectural education at least has been historically. So please give a warm thank you to our guests. So glad you're here. And um, let's go back to the studio energized and um, do the good work.